Hi, my name is Bob Swiderski. The following video is a recording of an event that we called Fireside Chat with panelists Steve Kruger, the then Executive Director of Voice of the Faithful, Thomas Doyle, Patrick Wall, Jason Berry, A.W. Richard Sipe, the co-chair of the Minnesota SNAP chapter, Belinda Martinez, and SNAP National Director, David Clossy. The event was put on by the Minnesota Survivors Network uh, and co-sponsored by the Twin City Area Voice of the Faithful. I think what's important uh, as you look at this video is this activity happened before the California settlements, before Bernard Law went running to Rome and so many of the other activities um, that you're familiar with. It was a cold night in Minnesota, yet it was very uh, warming inside. We are still amazed at the number of survivors and supporters that turned out for our two-day activity. Uh, we met friends um, who have been champions in the fight to recover from and to prevent the sexual abuse of all children. I want to thank survivor Tom Mawald from Winona for providing the DVDs that we used to produce this video of an historic panel discussion in Minneapolis. I hope you find this informative and inspirational. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Bob, first of all, for inviting me. It is truly an honor to be here, particularly with this panel. Um, I am really the new kid on the block. Um, I've been the executive director of The Voice of the Faithful now for uh, just under two years, and uh, it's, it's really been uh, uh, kind of learning under fire, so to speak. Uh, I was a Pew Catholic uh, that uh, on January the 6th uh, had my life, uh, 2002, uh, had, uh, had my life changed a little bit. But a number of the people up here uh, have been fighting the battle much, much longer. Coming out here today is a pilgrimage of sorts for me. Um, I actually lived in the Twin Cities area for about a year and a half in 1990 and 1991. Uh, I was on a consulting project out here and I essentially lived out here for about a year and a half, like I say, and it was at that time, if you remember, that uh, uh, the James Porter case uh, came to light. And I remember reading about that and there was also a lot going on with me. Spiritually, as a Catholic, I was questioning my faith. Uh, I should say I was not questioning my faith. I was questioning the church. And uh, at the same time, I was growing in faith. And then this, uh, this case was in the headlines in the Twin Cities um, almost every day. And then, of course, he was extradited back to Massachusetts. And it was 
kind of coincident with the point in time when I moved back to Massachusetts, and then it was on the front page of the Boston Globe. And of course, that was a point in time when Cardinal Law uh, was taking the Boston Globe to task, saying that uh, the Boston Globe was was creating this kind of you know out of the norm scandal. And he used very harsh language. And then, kind of looking back, it it appears as if uh, he protested a little bit too much. <laughs> I'd like to recite the mission statement of the Voice of the Faithful. I want to give you a Voice of the Faithful perspective of where we are today. Um, our mission statement is to be a prayerful voice, attentive to the Spirit, through which the faithful can actively participate in the governance and the guidance of the Catholic Church. We have three goals. But our first goal, and the goal that really gave rise to our existence, is to support victims and survivors of clergy sexual abuse. Today's environment in the aftermath of the audits, which I think everybody here is probably familiar with, which came out in January, the Office of Child and Youth Protection. And then, of course, we had the National Review Board reports and the John Jay study. And the environment that we're in today, I think, was really defined by the, uh, the headline in the, in the New York Times on Saturday, February 28th, which said that Bishop Gregory now declares the crisis history. I think a lot of us were... Um, really, really shocked when we, you know, read the reports, but we were deeply saddened and deeply disappointed when we heard him refer to this as history. But there's one story that ties all this together, which is bishop accountability. If you listen to Wilton Gregory, they've done their job. They've done the audits, they got, they got good grades, some of them even got commendations, and now it's history. Well, we know that, we know that it isn't history. And the question that I concern myself with almost every day is how do we make sure it isn't history? How do survivors make sure it isn't history? And one of the things that we have started to promote, uh, as many of you might know, we ran an ad in the Sunday New York Times, the 29th. The headline of the ad reads, Our trust has been violated, but not our faith. And at the bottom of the ad, it says, Add your voice to the voice of the faithful. It's time to return responsibility to Catholicism. And the way that we have to hold the bishops accountable is Catholics need to be responsible in doing that. Catholics, few Catholics, need to step forward, need to take some kind of action. That's what it's going to take in order to continue to, um, to bring the issues to raise the issues, to surface the issues of the dysfunctional culture in the church that allowed this to happen. Um, I would argue that today the leadership in the Catholic Church is coming from the laity because the laity are the people who have stood up. In essence, I would suggest to survivors that the response of the Catholic Church to survivors has been the voice of the faithful. The voice of the faithful is, for the most part, comprised of few Catholics who said to themselves, 
If I'm not part of the solution to this problem, then I'm part of the problem. At the end of the day, I do believe that, that there is hope for justice and healing for survivors because two years ago, we wouldn't have all been in this room. And today we are. And uh, I think that, that we really need to focus on what has been accomplished. Uh, and we have to take some consolation in knowing that we're really, uh, that we're really just getting started. Thank you. And it's, it's important, I think, that you realize, uh, first of all, that you live in a church, a particular church that's extremely unique. Um, St. John's Abbey and the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, and the way they operate and historically how it's all come off. The second thing I want to talk about is the suppression of monasteries. And the third thing I want to talk about is the challenging the 5013C status of nonprofits. We have in this state of Minnesota um, the, the largest Benedictine monastery in the world. It's not, uh, it's not a mistake, and if you just forget about it and pretend it's not there, you're probably discounting 20% of the most powerful people in this state. Anywhere from the alumni uh, work for the CIA, the alumni are judges, the alumni are authors, the alumni are big insurance people, St. Paul companies. The alumni have penetrated every aspect of this culture. And the reason that's important is because Johnnies are extremely loyal, and Johnnies hate Tommies. <laughs> In fact, tomorrow, you think this is stupid, but tomorrow they're finishing off the three-on-three -three competition at St. John's to see what team will challenge the, the Tommies at the Target Center here in two weeks at halftime. The battle between the Archdiocese and the monastery continues, and it goes back to a, a grand old story where uh, Abbot Alexis and Archbishop John Ireland had a bit of a going of the ways. And Archbishop John Ireland was very successful in getting the abbot removed. And from that point on, the two religious institutions have hated one another, absolutely hated one another. When you look at how St. John's has penetrated every single aspect and the number of students that have come out of the schools, you see the medieval approach to culture, you see the medieval approach to worldview. So basically what I'm trying to say is the church has taught and pretty much stuck in your head that there is no distinction between faith and church. That's, I call that a Catholic slip. And that's a natural Catholic slip because it's driven into your head. It's also driven into your head that an ordained person such as myself or Tom or Richard or Terry, we live on an existential plane that's higher than the rest of y'all. <clears throat> it's a little hard to, to understand, but that's what you've been taught, and that's what you were told for years and years and years. And that's why clergy have incredible access and power to vulnerable people. The expectation is they will do the right thing. We've known for centuries that they make mistakes, and some of them make really bad mistakes, and they make it over and over and over until somebody steps in to stop them. Monasteries have been suppressed. I put this forward as one possibility uh, to take care of the problem because monasteries connect all the way back. I'm not just talking about back to medieval Ireland. I'm talking all the way back to uh, Casino, Subiaco, early in the history of Italy, which is a big influence within the church. And one of the strange things that I'm sure you've seen come out in the news is a whole idea of the stupid man-boy society where the older men train in the younger kids. That's part of that Greco-Roman worldview that if perverted, a very intelligent priest or monk can use on, on a child or a vulnerable adult. That's been done. It's been
been done for centuries. If you talk to Mrs. McDonough, which is Kevin's grandmother in Stillwater, she'll tell you it's Monk's disease. <laughs> That's what she told me. This is well known within the tradition. But on one hand, it, officially, we discount it. We claim it doesn't exist. The suspension or suppression of monasteries is a possibility. It's been done for centuries, usually but done by a civil authority in order to take care of a problem within a monastery that can't be rooted out. Sometimes you have to cut it down to the root, let it go away, and, and then have it grow back in a newer, cleaner form, hopefully, at some time. It's a very radical measure, but if we have a radical situation, maybe we need to take radical measures. The third idea I want to put forward, and I've been batting this around with uh, a bunch of attorneys I work for in California, is the status of the 5013C uh, according to the IRS. The reason the official Catholic directory report that's uh, been put out is so important is because that's how the church reports to the federal government what is to be tax exempt. This is one of the brilliant pieces of financial strategy that Father Austin Ward employs all the time for the Archdiocese and Brother Benedict Leitner employs all the time for the monastery. They know how to make use of their tax-free zone better than anybody around. Father Gordon Tavis taught Brother Benedict how to do it. This is very important because it's in that tax-free zone that they receive federal and state money to do works for the state. Maybe because they're doing some salacious and felonious things and criminal things, maybe we should start to think about some of that tax money that goes to the religious institutes. It's important to consider that the only thing our leaders understand is money. If you hit them in the pocketbook, they will listen. That's the only way it's ever going to change. So I bring forward those couple ideas, and I hope that you have a better understanding that uh, the places I served in the Archdiocese, it was well known. The reason I was sent there is because there were multiple cases underway, and the reason Archbishop Flynn is here is because of, of the... Uh, the great job that Tom can talk about that he did in Lafayette, the great job that he did in, as a rector of a seminary, and that's why he's here with us in St. Paul. So the three things I'd like you to remember, the 5013 status as a possibility to challenge, the historical ability to conquer and suppress monasteries if things get really bad, and the third thing is part of the tradition that we stand in in this Greco-Roman worldview of coming from the ages that, unfortunately, children were chattel and women were chattel, and we need to change that. Just to In 1992, I published my third book, uh, which is called Lead Us Not Into Temptation. It was the first uh, national investigation of clergy sex abuse. Uh, much of it was based on reporting that I had done in the previous seven years. First section of the book is about a series of cases I uncovered in South Louisiana in 1985. And the latter sections of the book deal with the, uh, well, the rise of the survivors movement and a sort of parallel story, which at the time got me in a lot of trouble with the mavens of political correctness, and I suppose still does, and that is the gay priest movement of culture. For the record, I'm on most issues other than abortion, a liberal Democrat, and every time I talk about the crisis or get interviewed and mention <clears throat> gay priests, it raises all kinds of questions and issues. I don't think we really have an adequate uh, political vocabulary uh, to talk about this because one is either branded as homophobic or saying that there is a problem uh, or your PC saying anyone who says it's a problem is homophobic. So uh, I live in New Orleans. Uh, 
Every year at Mardi Gras, we have an extravagant uh, <laughs> drag queen show, which I've gone to for many years. So I guess in some rough way, I'm trying to occupy the middle ground and figure out what that dimension of the crisis means. Um, I've just published a book with Gerald Brenner, uh, an able colleague uh, who lives in Connecticut. It's called Vows of Silence. Oh, there we are. Truth in advertising. Uh, can you bump it up so that people can see the subtitle, The Abuse of Power in the Papacy of John Paul II, which has won me more friends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is what will happen. I predict that in the next 10 years there is going to be a slow erosion of support for the bishops of this country. This is what I believe. I mean, the part of me that's an activist can support you immediately. And look, Martin Luther King said, true peace is the presence of justice. And that is what we want, justice. He also, quoting Tillich, said that for justice to succeed, we, the activist community, must be about, and it's a wonderful phrase, love and calculation. How do you build a movement of people who love faith and I know that there are some survivors here, God bless all of you, who are outside of the faith. I'm speaking, I suppose, now just for a moment to Voice of the Faithful. But to build a movement that is intent on changing a corrupt power structure, you, you cannot assume that it will happen overnight. My belief is that it's going to take at least a decade for the structure to truly begin to change. Uh, and, and let me explain why. This is a power, the problem is the power structure from Rome on down. It is honeycombed with sexual secrecy, uh, going back generations, if not centuries. During the uh, research that I did in Rome, and this is uh, echoed in the findings that my colleague found when he was in Rome, we went uh, during different periods, the view at the Vatican is that this is a, a North American problem and it's been caused by uh, uh, a legal system that is out of control and a pagan news media that is over the top. That is the attitude at the Holy See. Uh, I don't know how long it will take for organizations like the Knights of Columbus, for example, whose foundation provides a substantial base of financial support to the Holy See, to recognize that groups like SNAP and Voice of the Faithful are not a bunch of wild-eyed radicals standing outside with pitchforks, mm -hmm. but rather people who have learned the truth and are trying to get others to recognize the truth. Financial pressure is one way to bring about the changes that the church so desperately needs. Um, I want to speak briefly about the book, and then since there are many other people who are here today, I'll pass the microphone on. Uh, Vows of Silence is about two men, primarily. Um, Tom Doyle, sitting to my left, uh, is the, I guess you'd say, the protagonist of the book. Uh, and we follow his career from when he entered the seminary in the early 1960s uh, through his studies of canon law until he became the canon lawyer at the Vatican Embassy in Washington uh, in the early 1980s. And I think one of the reasons Tom stands as such an inspiring figure to so many of us, and it's certainly the reason why uh, I decided to, uh, to build, to construct a narrative around him, is because you can tell the story of the American crisis through his life. Uh, just about every major explosion that has occurred, Tom has been there. Uh, the 1985 report that he co-authored uh, with Ray Mouton, the attorney from Louisiana, <coughs> Uh, who defended Father Gilbert Gothay on the criminal charges, a case I wrote about extensively, and the late Father Michael Peterson, a psychiatrist, is a document that took on a reproductive life of its own through the legal system, and by 2002 became a sort of benchmark in the news coverage that uh, the Globe and many other uh, newspapers and t uh, television stations and networks um, drew upon in their coverage. Uh, he, of course, left the employee of the Vatican Embassy because he spoke truth to power and joined the Air Force and has been 
uh, probably the, the most uh, effective instrument of damage to the hierarchy of this country uh, that I can think of. I don't know of another human being. And if they just made him a cardinal, well. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, here sits a man who, had he kept his mouth shut, I'm sure would be a bishop or cardinal today. And one of the encouraging things to me, and let me just say parenthetically, there are other things I write about in my life. This is not all that I do. I'm a jazz historian, among other things. And, but if he, if he had not performed the act of moral witness that had such an impact on this church, then I rather doubt that there would be other priests who have followed the trail that he blazed. Ken Lash, Ken, uh, Father Ken Lash, men of New Jersey, canon lawyer, spent years rebuilding a parish, and there's a section on him in the book, the new book, uh, in Mendham, New Jersey, where one priest literally mowed down a whole group of kids uh, from affluent families in a, a bedroom community of New York City. I think also Father James Scahill in uh, uh, Massachusetts, who uh, has for years waged a lonely, uphill battle against uh, Bishop Dupre of Springfield. Uh, just last month, Bishop Dupre was campaigning uh, visibly against gay marriage in Massachusetts and then abruptly, a few days later, resigned his position because the local newspaper had gotten interviews with the two young men who have accused him of abusing them uh, years earlier. He is now, as we speak, in St. Luke Institute uh, outside of Washington, D.C., the clergy psychiatric hospital, and all the indications are he will probably be indicted. So there are priests of integrity, as VOTF calls them, who are doing things that are quite important. Uh, the other person that the book focuses on, the second half of the book, is about Father Marcial Maciel de Golado. Most of you have probably never heard of Father Maciel. He is the founder and director of a religious order called the Legion of Christ. Uh, to my knowledge, Maciel and the Legion have yet to be named in the New York Times, ever. They have consciously flown under radar for many years. Uh, in 1994, I was contacted by a group of men from Mexico uh, claiming that they had been abused uh, repeatedly as seminarians in Rome by this priest. And as I studied the uh, documentation, they sent me the affidavits um, and realized that what they were alleging was not just abuse by a very powerful priest, but a priest in Rome who had been reported to Pope John Paul II in 1978, again in 1989. And after that, I decided this is a story that goes straight to the Vatican. Um, Soon after that, I was contacted by Gerald Renner, who had been doing stories on the Legion in Connecticut, where their American headquarters are, including a story about two seminarians who literally had to escape from the seminary, fleeing at night, almost as if they were racing away from a Georgia chain gang. Uh, this is a religious order that specializes in prep schools, buying or launching prep schools. Um, Father Maciel's picture is in each of these schools, and the children are taught that he is a living saint. Every legionary of Christ takes two vows. One is never to speak ill of Nuestro Padre, the founder, as he is called. And the other is to report on any other legionary, should he say anything critical about a superior. In other words, spying is rewarded as an act of faith. And so much of the book deals with the, uh, the brainwashing, the psychological coercion, and the incredible lust for money that is at the center of this ideological movement, otherwise known as a religious order, within the church today. Um, they have schools in Houston, Dallas, Cincinnati, uh, Atlanta. Minneapolis. Minneapolis, oh, is that right? Well, Chicago, 
Uh, I didn't know about the one in Minneapolis, but I learned something new every day. Um, and what is so striking about this is that the Bishop of uh, Columbus, Ohio, threw the Legion out of the diocese, said that they were not welcome there, and that the lay group of Regnum Christi uh, was not welcome. In contrast, uh, the Archbishop of Atlanta, uh, Donahue, has welcomed them with open arms and they're basically taking over Catholic religious education. This is the church we inhabit, a man who has been accused by nine men, two Spaniards and seven Mexicans, who in 1998 went to the Vatican and in the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, Cardinal Ratzinger's dicastery, they filed a canon law case asking that the priest be removed. Um, and Cardinal Ratzinger aborted it. Uh, Maciel is praised by Cardinal Sedano, the Secretary of State, whom we report intervened to personally terminate the proceeding. Can you imagine the Secretary of State in this country intervening in a legal proceeding to protect a pedophile? Yeah. This, this is part of the illness that pervades the power structure of this church, and it is why I think it is going to take quite some years before we change it. But when it happens, I think it will be like the crumbling of the Iron Curtain. I think it will happen night after night on television. We will see it with a great dramatic sweep. I don't know when that will happen, but at least for the present, uh, I'm proud to be here and hope to be part of the solution. Thank you. My name is Tom and I'm a recovering Catholic. <laughs> I'm not going to say a lot tonight. I've been involved in this nightmare for close to 20 years. It'll be 20 years in October when I first uh, got involved, and it was because I was simply asked to monitor the documentation on the infamous case that Jason has talked about, the case of Father Gilbert Gote down and the cover-up that had existed there. And were not for for the brave reporting of Jason Berry and the bravery of the publishers of the Times of Acadiana to overcome the threats by outside forces that would never have made the secular media, the electronic media would not have gotten involved, uh, there would never have been an indictment or probably a civil suit. So that changed history. I've been involved, as I've said, for 20 years in this. Um, it has been, for me, a gradual, progressive evolution in my life. Twenty years ago, nineteen years ago, I never imagined in my wildest dreams I would think the way I think, be the, be the way I am, or be sitting where I am tonight. My evolution began when I was a very conservative, orthodox, clericalist young priest. And high on my list, on my hit list, would have been Voice of the Faithful or a similar organization because they challenged what gave me identity and security, which was the institution. And that institution has been incredibly challenged over these past 20 years by a nightmare. And it has taken violence, especially against young boys and girls, adolescent young boys and girls, and adult women, violence against them, to wake up a sleeping, docile, sometimes soporific people, the real church. What I've learned over these years, not just cognitively, but in my soul and in my emotions, has been what the body of Christ really means. It doesn't mean simply a governmental structure founded in time that exists for its own sake. But it really does mean the believers, the halt, the lame, the blind, the unfortunate, the unattractive, the suffering, the ones who've made mistakes. That's the body of Christ. Another thing I've learned through all of this, and one of the most painful lessons, I think, has been the challenge to my own source of security. 
I was ordained in 1970. Being part of the organization, being part of the clerical subculture, gave me an identity, gave me a source of security, taught me how intoxicating power can be. I understand why people resist the news that sexual perversion among the clergy is so widespread. I think I can even understand why bishops throughout this country accuse Voice of the Faithful of having another hidden agenda and not allowing them to be on their property. It's because they pose a threat to the security. They are forcing us, just as the victims and as the survivors, I think, have forced the institution and forced me to take responsibility for my own spiritual legacy, for my own spiritual growth. I learned the very painful way that I can no longer depend on magical thinking, on being told by someone, this will give you salvation, that will give you salvation. And one of the wonderfully liberating things of this whole odyssey is when I fired the God that I had been laboring under. I got rid of the one who was negative, who was judgmental, who infused me with fear. I got rid of him. And I found a higher power that really is reflective of the Christ of the Scriptures. And I've seen over these 20 years, I think, a real dichotomy between what we call church and what the body of Christ is supposed to be. And oftentimes they'll say, well, we need to pray to the Holy Spirit for guidance through these difficult times. Our leaders, the, the, the ecclesiastical leaders, they're not my leaders, will say that. And the Spirit, I think, is speaking and moving and prodding and guiding. And it's here. It's with you. It's with Voice of the Faithful. It's with the victims. It's with the survivors. Pointing, prodding, pushing, and oftentimes a very painful way where we have to go. So that what we are will no longer simply be a kingdom. So we'll move from a kingdom to a community. From a monarchy to really something that reflects and has faith in the Spirit of Christ. Because if we have real faith in that spirit, we'll know that we don't have to depend on power, on fear, and on secrecy. I'm the founder of the Minnesota SNAP chapter library that is for survivors, and I mail the books out to folks if they can't get in, and they mail them back, or um, take them to the support group meetings, and that was on donation money. And in about a year, we have almost 100 titles, so I mean, that's not a huge library, but I don't know, it's got to haul it, so um, that's what we've been doing. But for the last seven and a half months um, in my spare time, I was uh, gathering together a little report that I released on Tuesday, and I named the names of 99 perpetrators that I had found. And that's my report. And but I felt that there was an accounting that needed to be done. And, and as a survivor here in Minnesota, I wanted my Minnesotans to know the history of clergy abuse in this, in this state. In my hometown, I knew that there had been one perpetrator there for sure. And I knew that the perpetrator had accessed me by virtue of substituting there on a weekend. But I found out more in the course of um, collecting newspaper articles. and. Um, when I found the fourth one, I hung my head and cried. So what I did, I have access to a database that has um, over 230 newspaper newspapers from across the country that provides full text of articles. And so I started out with the search. And so I pulled up articles about Minnesota perpetrators. And the first thing that I developed is the chronological history. Um, and this is a hard copy of all the documents that I printed, and this is a chronological history of clergy abuse in Minnesota. And it's helpful because uh, as the liaison, I get a lot of calls, and um, people talk, and, and, and it's just good to have some information. I think that we need to have some information. And so from, from this set of information, I got the names of perpetrators, put it in a database, and... Then I developed their service histories, employment histories around the state, and that's this binder, and this is the alphabetical listing by last name of the perpetrators, the 99 perpetrators that I named in my report. And then from this document, 
I developed um, a list of all the cities in Minnesota where they had served. They are not where allegations have surfaced, but where they have served. And if you look at the map in front of the table here, oh, he moved it, bless his heart, but that is all the cities that, that had uh, known perpetrators from my report served at those cities and locations at one time or another. That includes schools, hospitals, and um, it, when you look at it spread out like that, it's very sad because it's spread out from the northern woods to the southern prairie. I found a, a handful of uh, abuse situations by nuns and then two non-clergy, non-religious related uh, incidents of uh, miscon sexual misconduct in schools and they had acts in, in the Catholic schools. The, of the, for the 99 perpetrators, there were 302 assignments. And another thing that I did, the, another thing that I did from the service histories, I tallied up the number of years that the perpetrators were have it, were at least documented as having been supported on retirement funds by the archdiocese. And I broke it down by diocese and the total for Minnesota. It's not very big, but that's only the, the 99 perps that I mentioned. That does not include the the um, orders because generally they weren't listed. The, the perpetrators who belong to orders generally weren't listed as, as specifically retired, although I know some are. And it totaled up to be 147 years, and that's just the perps that I have right now. And I had, um, I have 40 some that I couldn't include. I set a deadline for my, my report at uh, February 27th, which was John, day, John J. Day. That was the last day that I would take names to try and get the service histories done and include them in my report. The next day, I, I got 29 new names. So the second report has already begun. Um, I, in, in my report, I list that there were 63 diocesan priests and then, then the other orders that, that had done perpetrators that I found. And of those 302 locations of the parishes that still remain open, 114 of them are affiliated to a parochial elementary school in some fashion or another. Some might be related to the same school, but it's 114 parishes, and the access to children should be alarming to lay Catholics. Well, I'd like to thank the Catholic, the, the Diocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, for that publicity we got last week and this week um, because of the arrest of a perpetrator, uh, an exploiter at that. So um, thank you to them. And Richard Clay.